compared to this and that. Um, all right, so here we are. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thanks that we're going to be reading Zephaniah chapter 3 tonight, Father. Lord, you are the author of the Word. Lord, you use men to get it on paper through your sovereignty. You could have done it a multitude of ways, however you saw fit. Uh, but you've chosen to allow us to be a part of your goodness, uh, you know, uh, of receiving your goodness through Jesus. And so, Lord, it's just cool that you use men, you use women to, um, man, you just bless us. So tonight, Lord, we look forward to reading about how, how you bless us in our relationship with you, God, and specifically what you were speaking to Zephaniah. And God, I pray that we would rightly divide your word, what you intended, uh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher tonight. And so by faith, we believe that you're going to speak to us. Guard our hearts against any uh, misconceptions, Lord. But Lord, awaken us toward exciting new realities. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. All right, so Zephaniah. Uh, <coughs> we want to mention something. Prophetic book, right? Minor prophet. Minor just meaning because it's small. I may repeat some of the stuff that Tom or Pastor Jim mentioned or we mentioned in our small groups. Um, but that's a good way to retain information. Zephaniah being called Minor Prophet just because of the size of his book. It's one of the smaller uh, content sizes, so we call it Minor Prophet. Prophetic word. Remember in the Bible, prophecy can do and be uh, realized in three ways. Both past, present, and future. So when God gives a prophetic word in Scripture, He was talking to the people then which would be our past. He is speaking to us now, our present. And He's also speaking to future fulfillment. And that's because He's God, right? He can communicate on that level. We may not have a full realization of what that fulfillment is going to look like. We see now dimly, but then face to face. So we can, through the Holy Spirit, uh, put together contextually some of the pieces and come to a generalized conclusion which often is pretty accurate okay you know as long as it, 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 it's uh, you know not eisegesis but exegesis throughout the scripture that means comparing other scriptures and bringing it together to find a common message alright so here, here's what I want to mention okay Remember, the Word of God is what? God breathed. Living. Right? Oh. God breathed. Dios, Dios knows us. And He's not dead. So it's an active work. Right? So when you read a prophecy, you can expect to come in contact with a living message from God. I mean, active. I should say active message. The message in itself, you know, is just a message. But... Power, empowered by God. This thing is alive when we read it. Okay? Because it's His spoken word, which will not cease. So, I thought about it like a, a bubble. Three different bubbles of prophecy. Okay? So you got, imagine, imagine the word prophecy. Okay? In your head. Prophecy is the banner. And from that banner, you got three connecting bubbles. One being past, present, and future. Okay? That's what the prophetic word is going to do. But above that, remember, it's living work. Okay, so this isn't just uh, a history book. Alright, it's much more. Alright, here we go. Zephaniah chapter 3, uh, verses 1 and 2. Let's start there. Woe to her who is rebellious and polluted, to the oppressing city. She's not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She is not drawn near to her God. All right, let's jump in. So, verses 1 and 2, obviously God is talking to His people, uh, His chosen city, Jerusalem. Uh, we remember that, you know, we can ask, why did God choose Jerusalem? God wanted to choose a people group on the earth to reveal His glory to the rest of the earth. And He chose 
the, the Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the Hebrews. He chose them. They're his chosen people, the apple of his eye. He could have chosen anybody he wanted to, right? But that's where, and so we look to Jerusalem and God's relationship with them to see how his glory is revealed in man and how we can also experience it. Look at the look at the uh, what he calls them out for. Look what God he, he specifically he's addressing uh, some things here. Look, he said she has not verse two. She has not obeyed his voice. Not received correction. Not trusted. And not drawn near. Not obey God. Then after disobedience, correction comes. There was a rejection of correction. There was a lack of faith. And then what comes with that? It's a not coming near to God. Dude, this is this is awesome. Is that us? That's me. How often is that me on a consistent basis, right? Where I don't obey God, right? That's normal, right? Unfortunately, hopefully with maturity, that's the less than, right? I don't obey. God brings His correction because He disciplines us whom He loves, right? So He loves me, so He wants to say, hey, you're, you know, He could, if He didn't love me, He would just say, ah, see you later, I'll get it. He doesn't do that to Jerusalem. He doesn't do that with us. So he gives me correction. Sometimes I don't receive the correction for whatever plethora of excuses I have. I'm not trusting God. God is saying, in essence, my way is better. And I'm saying, God, no, my way is better. I'm not trusting your way. That's what I'm doing. And then that causes me to what? Not draw near. Verse 3. Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. The very leaders that God chose to bring order, to communicate on His behalf, are the ones who were leading the people astray. Remember that Zephaniah is a contemporary of Jeremiah. Okay? And remember in the book of Jeremiah, one of the big pushes was the prophets, oh, excuse me, the so-called speakers for God, the priests, the false prophets, during this time, were telling people that you're not going to be in Babylon long to, to not take up roots there. But God was telling them, no, you're going to be in Babylon for quite the season to go ahead and become established where I take you captive. Okay, so, you know, maybe the desire of the heart was, hey, we're going to be taken captive for our sin. We won't be there long. You know, let's not become too acclimated where God puts us because we're coming back quick. There may be seasons where the correction is short. There may be seasons of correction is extended, right? And in this instance, during this time to Jerusalem, God said clearly, hey, this is going to be a little bit longer correction. It's going to be 70 years and I'm going to let the land rest because for 490, y'all disregarded the Sabbath. So you're going to be there a while. Go ahead and plant. Take up residence. Occupy. 
I think that that message for us currently is sometimes God places us in a situation potentially temporarily and He wants us to do well there. Even if it was through correction that we ended up there in the first place. Even if it was because of a mistake, but through His sovereignty, He placed us there. Our mistake, His sovereignty, or man's mistake around us, but in reality, God's sovereignty. Think of Joseph, right? Man tried to betray, God was using it for good, that many might be, be saved. So think about this. You might be in a job, you might be in a family situation, and you're like, man, this is, this is a battle, or I don't understand this. Hopefully I'm not in this position long. Do well in that moment. You know, let's, let's be men who, it can be said about us as, as mature godly men. I think that's a testimony of a, a true godly man. It's not to backbite against the authority where we have been placed, even if it's temporary. Temporarily, we honor the authority that has been placed in our life, even if it's in a strange situation. And you're like, well, how, this is, how can there be an authority in some of these vague situations? Remember, you always have an authority, the Word of God. Now, sometimes God might place uh, people uh, underneath that, but above you in that current situation that we are to honor as well. So the, 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 the gist of it is, I think, uh, whenever God asks us, uh, whenever God places us somewhere to obey Him where we are currently and to thrive. I mean, give it one ten. When people see our lives, see, that's going to be even, an even greater testimony. It's not a testimony if we're put in a, a weird situation and we're backbiting against that situation. It's not a testimony if, if unbelievers see us in a position that we don't want to be in and we're kicking against the goats. Like, this, this stinks. Man, we're so in here. I mean, some of those realities exist. I look forward to heaven. <laughs> you know, heaven's going to be great. You know, I ain't going to have to deal with all this mess. You ain't either. But, Here's where we are. So help. Let, we pray that we would make application of and thrive. I mean, 110, Lord. Dude, we're gonna have our days. We all know that. Okay. But let's uh, get back up on our horse. And something that's interesting here. I think. Do we? Are we drawn to wicked influences and leaders in our life? Because we have itching ears, or we hear from them what we want. And we do we go to places and receive from others who condone and justify our sin. So you had you had a, a, the priests were established. Perhaps in some ways the people kind of were like, Yeah, these are our guys. These are our leaders, because they were allowing them to do what the heck they wanted them to do. You see, they were evil, but there was a numb, it was numb. Or they had become so jaded, you know, the more you sin, the thicker that haze gets in front of your eyes, all right? You know, it's kind of like not eating uh, vegetables, but eating, you know, donuts, not just once, but like for seven months straight. You keep it, you're going to sugar it out. You know, Same thing with sin. You know, you keep delighting in sin, which your body is not created to be nourished by disobedience to God, you're going to become clouded. You're going to suffer physically, mentally, emotionally. So it's important, gentlemen, that we have that, as Pastor Kevin mentioned, as Pastor David has taught us, as Jesus exemplified in Scripture, a base around us of godly men consistently. This is a great example. Men's breakfast. Even more intimate in some ways. This is a great place to meet those men who you can carry on that more intimate relationship with. So that you know they're going to speak godliness into your life. Okay, you don't want to, uh, honestly, you don't want to develop an intimate relationship with someone whose ways are not yoked like yours. You don't want to be unequally yoked. Because that person, you're going to be able to come to them with some poor decision you've made, 
against God, and they're going to be like, oh man, you're good, dude. You're good. They're going to justify your sin. And you don't want that, man. You want people who are going to make you uncomfortable. Not then, <laughs> but for the long term, right? Alright, is that good? So, um, I, I wonder, is that why a lot of people stay away from the Word and from church? Because they don't, they don't want to come and be confronted. Do the, do the Word, do, do, in grace, in mercy, not, not hellfire and brimstone in an antagonistic way. But people don't come to church because they don't want to hear the truth. Because they know the truth. Their conscience bears witness with the truth. And they're going to be convicted and challenged to repent. I think it's important that we take that in consideration in our communication when God sends us outside of here and we're witnessing. You know, we're in a plethora of uh, beliefs wherever God sends us and we want to uh, our method should be love. Love sometimes is telling the truth. It's always telling the truth. It's never lying. Sometimes love is silent and, and, and it's, a, it's a compassionate servitude. It's not a you suck, you're going to hell. You know, it's a how can I wash this guy's feet to help him. Remember Pastor David's story uh, about Ken Hooper who just passed away who built his guitars and he was taking this Christian guitar and going out and playing publicly, secularly. You thought about that? Have you, have you thought about that? He's taking this Christian piece and he's going and doing secular music. And so this guy would say, love you and miss you. And that's that was the, uh, you know, I, I used to, I used to be in deep sin. <laughs> and uh, my, I have a lot of Puerto Rican family and a lot of Catholicism in the family. And so I have a godmother, you know, which is a Catholic thing. And in some ways, in some ways, it's just, if something happened to my parents, that's where I could go live. But uh, she was older, my aunt, she's still out. And she would write me these letters, dude. I would come home. I'd be gone for weeks. And I'd come home and I'd open the mailbox I'd see where my mom put my energy. And I had this letter from this godly influences in my family. It was just love. I love you. God loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. He is, his arms are open wide. You know, it was sometimes hard to understand because she was, didn't speak much English. But it was great. And so when I'm in this battle, I would go back. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't repeat, man, I'm going to hell or... My aunt is really speaking bad to me. I wouldn't go reciprocate that message to the other sinners that I was currently hanging out with. I probably wouldn't have if she wrote it. But because it was such a love, it was such a Holy Spirit woo, I would actually go back to the places where I, I was entangled and say, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. Y'all listen to these letters I'm giving. You know? To the point where the people that I was with came to the recognition, you don't belong here. To the point with, to the point where, like, I'm in this the, some demonstrative sins, you know, it's all sin, right? But, but they would say, you know, you're not part of us, right? You know, you're called to serve the Lord. I mean, dude, dude are you kidding me? Like, we are like way out there in all fashions, okay? So when I did repent and go back, some of those people who I talked to now have repented because they saw it was real. It wasn't through damnation. It was God in His character. I didn't obey. He was trying to lovingly correct me. He said, man, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. Trust me. Draw near me. Okay. Verse 5. The Lord is righteous in her midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Isn't that the best? God will do no unrighteousness. Verse 5. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails. But the unjust knows no shame. I've cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I've made their streets desolate with none passing by. Their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction. 
so that her dwelling would not be cut off, despite everything for which I punished her. But they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. What a plea. God's like, look, man, I am I am even putting my punishment on other people whom you can clearly see to get you to fall back in love with me. It's clear that's He's like, look, look, they, they, this is what the this is the full picture of rejection of me looks like. Death. That's what the Bible says. Right? The, the wages of sin is fun? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for a moment, right? Temporarily. But then it brings death. We so often, gentlemen, put the temporal above the eternal in our life. You know, if I can get my children, my family, if I can convince myself that every decision should be based upon the eternal, not in this moment, that I'm investing there, I don't even fully know what that means when I say that, okay? You've heard, you've heard me mention that before. When I say we're storing our rewards, I'm investing in the kingdom, we're pleasing the Jesus. We're pleasing our Father. You know, that's the, that's the investment. You know, and yes, there's probably going to be some surrounding blessings with that for eternity. And that could, that could and should motivate us. All right. So, uh, judgments um, are meant to turn us back to God. A true child of God will turn back when corrected. Think about the problem. So, uh, I'm going to mention some of in the next couple verses uh, here in, in verse 8. Um, so Pastor Chuck mentioned some things. In the 80s, he was having, uh, he became acquaintances and then friends with a leading um, researcher in Jerusalem and Israel uh, who would dig, one of the uh, site leaders of digging and looking for artifacts in Israel. And he had, had lunch with this guy one day and he was asking, hey, you know, give me the update, what's cooking here? And he said that, um, they, uh, they were excavating around uh, the old city of David. And uh, this is before, you know, a lot of it has been found in the last 20 years where uh, it's at the um, southern part of Jerusalem. It's kind of slopey. Um, anyways, a lot of cool stuff there. So he said that, uh, you remember when Rome would come and destroy uh, the ruins, uh, they would, instead of digging out and when they would come to re-inhabit the land, when God's people would come back after captivity or when they would be dispersed, when they come back, instead of fixing that, they would just throw dirt on top of their home and rebuild. So what, what they're doing is when, uh, I guess when um, opportunity arose where they could dig down to that next layer, they would. And in these homes before the punishment and the correction, when they look inside these old ruins, they would find a house full of idols, metal idols, in the Jews' homes, in the Hebrews' homes, not the pagan homes, the, the God's people's homes. Um, justice, justice, well, there's a lot here, guys. There's a lot here. Okay, let's just mention a few things. Are we coming into God's assembly with internal sin? Are we coming into God's house with underneath the layers of our heart idols and internal sin? Of course, we all wrestle. Okay, we're all wrestling. We're here fighting. There's going to be battles for any uh, person following Jesus. Um, but my, do we? You remember that verse? Is, Chapter 1 or chapter 2. Do we leap over the threshold almost frolically faking? You know? Faking. You know, come in here, high five! You know, oh, bro, let's pray, man. Yeah, let's pray about this. Listen, I'm not condemning. I mean, this is a ministry. Let's have an talk, right? <laughs> so, you know, you. And you're wrestling with that, man. You come in and you're front when you go back to your game because your idol isn't dormant. Your idol is active. 
our idols are active sometimes. You know, and we, we're looking forward to, while we're here, going back and re-engaging in our idol. We, I say we, you know, I, you know, I've been through this. So, <clears throat> it's important that we are dealing with the idols in our heart. Um, look at this. This is so good right here. Verse... Verse 5, second, second part there. So it says, in first part, first part, verse 5, the Lord is righteous in her midst. Um, it says, He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning, what? Every morning He brings His justice to light. You know, I think about this. For those who don't know God, every morning is judgment. For those who are in Christ, His mercy is new every morning. It's both. It's both. He's not like schizophrenic, right? You know, but those who have an intimate relationship with him, what is it? As soon as you call on, it's his love and mercy. Scott, man, today, thank you, Lord. Yes, God, for your fresh cup of mercy and grace to me today. Isn't that good? So, you know how you can tell if you're an alcoholic? If you're flustered when you can't have it. I'm not an alcoholic. Well, then don't have any. How are you reacting? Okay? You know how you have an idol in your heart? If when you can't have it, you get flustered. You're like, it's not an idol. But I'm out there in the rain trying to adjust my satellite dish. <laughs> you know? To get that game on. I gotta get this game. Well, this is a little frustrating, <laughs> you know. And the Lord is just like, just give him a quick check, you know. He's okay with the game, you know, <laughs> depending, right? But he's like, hey, let's let's have some me time. And you're like, it's boom, boom, rain. Like, Bang, is it on yet? You know? You know the reality of how many times, I mean specifically the TV I can think of, you know in the last, uh, I don't know, how many years since I've been watching TV, um, how he's grown us, each one of us, from that first moment where we first entered in a relationship with Jesus, right, and we had stuff. He was wanting to take preeminence over anything in our heart. And that, you know, those wrestling matches were, we, we, we didn't give up quite as quick back then, but now we're like, oh, my bad God, more often. And that, you know, thank, ain't, aren't we thankful? Look what he's done. Look what he's doing. Isn't he good? Remember that time he said, I would do the work of your life when you first came to him? Hadn't he been faithful to slowly and surely continue this pot, this beautiful vessel for His glory that we are to get the infirmities of the, the idols out, the imperfections out of it as we're on the wheel. This is a beautiful potter. Notice verse 7. Um, it says, I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction." He's like, surely you will fear me. You receive instruction. Remember, the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. The beginning of wisdom. Uh, it's so, so interesting. When I was little, no, 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 rephrase. So recently, my mom was like, hey, I got this, uh, the Ten Commandments, I crossed it for you, you know? And I was like, okay, you know, it's like a big deal to my mom, right? And I was like, yeah, you know? Okay, mom, cool, the Ten Commandments, you know? And, uh, Mom, if you're watching this at some point, keep listening. So, so uh, I wanted it though because it's my mom, right? So she gave me this, these cross stitch Ten Commandments. It's kind of large. It's pretty elaborate actually. And I noticed it had an older frame on it. Like the frame was like older, and I was like, that looks like an old frame, like not something you would see today in Walmart or something. And I got to thinking about it. She had made it like when I was born, and it was in my house. And all these memories started coming back about seeing that in my house growing up. And that's it. That's the same one. 
And here's my mom who built her life on the falling in love with Jesus and the growth that that is. But I see the fruit in her life now. I'm like, that's going to my bedroom, right in my bed, so I can see it when I get up and lay down. Not because I can keep the law, but because I want to fear the Lord and treasure His commands. When I treasure that, I put that as a priority in my life. As I respect and revere our King. Man, the fruit. The fruit. <coughs> Not even me hitting the mark all the time. But I for Jesus, Lord, once again. I receive your correction. I trust, Lord. This hurts, but I trust. So, treasure God's commands. Gentlemen, there's much fruit in it. Verse 8. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation. All my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. Alright, so... Something Pastor Chuck mentioned I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. The word indignation in the Old Testament is the equivalent of the Great Tribulation in the New Testament. So when I, I, I have a, I'm just sharing this treasure with you, this gold nugget that I have not fully dug out yet. But he says that when you see the word indignation in the Old, it means uh, the Great Tribulation. And the new, and look at it, if you read it, it makes perfect sense. Look at it. So therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. So there's a waiting for judgment. And then, what's the judgment? My determination is to what? Gather the nations. So all nations are going to come together. To my assembly of kingdoms. He's bringing them to a designated place to pour on them my indignation. Guys, it's Megiddo. This is where he's going to call them together. Uh, my fear, all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire. If you look in Revelation chapter 19, and, uh, you know, even prior to that, where it talks about him bringing fire down from heaven on the other the nations that are gathered together. Um, so here God is speaking of the great tribulation period as he gathered, gathers the nations. Of course, gathering them into the great valley of Megiddo. This is a direct quote from Chuck Smith. For the great battle of Armageddon, where I will pour upon them all my indignation, even all my fierce anger. So there's a command in here. So God is saying, okay, so remember, go back, prophecy. Then, now, future. Alright? So the then was they're going into captivity. Okay? Jerusalem was going into captivity. That was the then. That is a micro picture of the future Great Tribulation. When they go into captivity, but um, they're hiding in Petra. In the future, they're going to be hiding because all nations are going to come against them. And that's going to cause repentance when they see God's wrath on the rest of the nations. Uh, and they're going to say, he, you know, Yahweh's God and this is going to be revived. I don't know how it's all going to work. It's going to be amazing. So, point is, what's the now? Well, look at the now. The now says, wait for me. The beginning of verse 8. Therefore, wait for me. Gentlemen, we know that there is a blessing in waiting. It's faith. Listen, if there wasn't waiting, there wouldn't be opportunity for trust and faith in God, right? If He just dumped out the treasure chest all day long, everybody's going to be running in the money. Just symbolic. Running in the blessings. You know, if God's handing out candy all day, everybody's going to follow the trail of candy, right? And He does. He does give us blessings like that, right? Uh, but, 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 but as a show of His affection for us. Hey, remember? You know why? Because He didn't want those... Uh, okay, listen. Lord, help me articulate. Jesus shared parables... Because there was so much power in what he was saying that anybody who heard would be greatly blessed. So he said it, uh, the truth. The truths of God are so good, anybody who hears will receive a, 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 a current blessing and a future blessing. Okay? But God wanted a relationship of love. So he told it in a parable so not that so so those who heard. 
Uh, the ones who would truly be seeking Him would seek out the truth and what He was saying and receive the blessing because of their love for Him, not because of the treasure that came with the, the truth. Do, does that make any sense? Okay? God's telling them, the, in Jesus in the New Testament tells parables. Okay? And the parables are true and they're rich. And there's treasure in making application of them. Okay? Jesus wanted the, the hearers who were pursuing Him and not the multiplied fish. Not just the, the benefit. So He told it in a way where you had to dig down and listen to and seek Him out to get the full understanding of what He was saying. And then you would get the temple lesson too. Love it. Alright, so there's a blessing in waiting. Tearing with what He has given us currently until the next part of the promise is fulfilled. So right now there's a blessing, gentlemen, in us occupying with excellence, trusting in what He's doing. It's an opportunity for further reward. Uh, John Corson says this, John Corson says, we know the promise where we're like, we're waiting on his return, right? And we're waiting on the rapture. Um, whatever your belief is there, we're waiting on Jesus. <laughs> Regardless, we're waiting on Jesus, right? And we, the, the, the scripture is what? God isn't uh, slow, but he's patient, uh, willing that none should perish, right? Well, remember, I'm not going to elaborate, but a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, okay? And so, uh, really, Jesus has only been gone a few days. But it's a long day. And what happens in a long day? What can you do in a longer day? Get more done. To receive more wage. Jesus is giving us a longer day <coughs> to store up more reward. So not only is there a blessing on more people getting to come into the kingdom... There is more blessing for us as we participate in what He's called us to do. We will gain more reward in heaven. Verse 9. Amen. Yeah. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Um, two things. Number one, do you see the uh, pointing back to the Tower of Babel there? Take it out. For then I will restore to the peoples of pure language. Restoration of the language. Remember, they all had one language, but they got too cocky because of what they could accomplish. And they built a tower. And God dispersed them and disoriented the common language. Um, something else is interesting here. When it says pure language, uh, that potentially could be Hebrew because there's no swearing in Hebrew. There's no cuss words in Hebrew. Isn't that cool? So uh, I heard uh, someone say, I don't know who was a pastor. He said he heard a doctor speaking in Hebrew one time. And then in the middle of the Hebrew, he would heard an English cuss word. And then continuation of Hebrew. Because there was no, there was no swear, word, swear word. So he had to use the English to cuss and swear. And then he go back to Hebrew. Interesting. Um, so we look forward to, isn't that cool? We're all going to have, potentially, I don't know, that's conjecture, Hebrew maybe. All right, verse 8 again, and then we're going to read verse 13. So we're going to back up and we're going to get some context. Man, I've got to hurry up. Therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to so gather them, remember, to pour out on them my indignation. All my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshippers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Little side note here, potentially um, Ethiopia, maybe Solomon did impregnate the Queen of Sheba. And uh, she went back impregnated to the area of Ethiopia, potentially, and she had a child, and he was Jew, and there's going to be a calling back of those Jews from Ethiopia. There is a large population of Jews in Ethiopia right now. Uh, continuing on. 
Um, so the daughters of my dispersed, end of verse 10, the, the daughters of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. Verse 11, in that day you shall not be ashamed, ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. It's a reference back to the beginning of the chapter when we talked about coming into uh, to God's uh, assembly with idols in your heart. Okay, Verse 12, I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Have you ever had peaceful sleep before? Isn't it nice? You know, when you can sleep peacefully, you're not woken up by anxiety or thought or whatever. Okay, so look, there's a sequence here from verse 8 through 13. Okay, um, in verse 8, what is it? It's judgment. Okay, therefore, uh, until the day I rise up for plunder, my determination is to gather nation to my assembly of kings to pour out their indignation. Uh, so verse 8 is judgment. Verse 9, restoration. Then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. Verse 10, an offering of gratitude because of the restoration. Look, um, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers, the daughters of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. After the offering of gratitude, verse 11, look, a humbleness and humility, recognizing it's a free gift and that he's done it, says in verse 11, in that day you shall not be ashamed. For any of your deeds in which you transgress against me, for then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. Now there's a humility that's been established after the judgment, correction, receiving of restoration. Now there's a humility recognizing we were wrong, you judged us, but you healed us, we're thankful for it. And uh, that, look, look, verse 12, strengthened trust. I will leave you in your midst, a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. But remember in verse 1 and 2, we just read that they did not trust the Lord. Now they trust the Lord. And then uh, verse 13 is eternal glorification. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, but they're sinless. They shall, uh, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Their enemy has been taken away. That's eternal glorification. The devil's not there anymore to mess with them. I love it. I love it. I love it. Judgment, verse 8. Restoration, verse 9. An offering of gratitude to the Lord, in verse 10. A new humbleness, in verse 11. With the recognition it's a free gift. Verse 12, strengthen trust. And verse 13, eternal glorification with the king. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Full kingdom glory. Full kingdom glory. He is in your midst. That's going to be it. Verse 16. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. How many times have you repeated this? Repetition means importance. He has said it three times in a row. Let's see here. He said it in verse 15 and 17. Did he say it before that? No, so he says it twice. So it says at the end of verse 15, The king of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall see the disaster no more. Verse 16, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion. Let your hands not be weak. Let not your hands be weak. Verse 17, The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 
So, uh, the greatest blessing in heaven is what? Getting to be with Jesus. That's it. That's the greatest blessing in heaven. All right? Him being in our midst. And that happens here too. Like on Sunday mornings, there's a verse in Hebrews, I believe, that says, He inhabits the praises of His people. Um, I don't know how big you are on... Uh, Uh, visions and signs and wonders, you know, I believe, I believe it, you know, so, but, um, one time I was in worship here, and clearly could see Jesus behind the worship team, just there, you know, just arms outstretched, you know, and another time, hey, here's what it is, call me crazy if you want to, I actually saw this, I don't know, this is years ago, I, this is at the other building, on Bone Hammer, I saw him going up and down the aisles, dancing, not Drawing attention to himself, like a, I almost thought of it like a King David rejoicing. Like I actually read a book from uh, Pastor John Corson's son in the last month who just died. Um, Peter John Peter John Corson is his son's name, and he wrote a book before he died about heaven. And the whole book was about he just saw dancing in heaven. He was like, "That's it." And Pastor John was like, "I read a lot of books on heaven, but this one seems to make the most sense." There's rejoicing for eternity. Anyways, all right, so um, look at this. Verse 16, 17, some more fruit in here. Uh, first you see his capability, and then you see his action. Verse 16, it says, In that day shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear it, let your hands not be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. That, prayer, that sentence right there. So because he is mighty, his attributes are that he saves, he can save, he has the power to save because he is mighty. So when you are in relation to God and he tells you something crazy, you're like, well, that is a big word, God, really? He can do it because remember who you're talking to. Okay? He is mighty. So you can say, listen, the biggest, what's the biggest miracle? <laughs> Our redemption, right? You know? What do you mean he's going to save me and let me live forever? Hey, man, you're talking to God. You know, that's what he wants to do. That's what he's done for you. All right. Uh, makes me think of Psalm 139. Okay, so look. Verse, uh, what does it say? Um, at the end of verse 17, the last two parts, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. You know Psalm 139. I know I've got six minutes left. Um, Psalms 139. That's good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 17. The whole chapter is what I thought, but... Uh, 139, 17. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. The king is rejoicing over his people to see. It's phenomenal. Yes, let's not forget that's Israel. You know, uh, it's Israel's full restoration, and we have been grafted into that. Don't believe in replacement theology. But, um, I do believe that. Um, there's going to be lots of celebration in the future. All right. Here we go. I just read 16, 17. Verse 18 to 20. Um, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly. Who are among you. To whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame. Do you hear that? Read that again, verse 19. Behold, at that time I'll deal with all who afflict you. Obviously, eternal damnation. Okay? For those who rejected the king. And it says, I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. The millennial reign, reigning with Jesus, there's going to be responsibilities. There's obviously going to be honor given to Israel. Um, verse 20, at that time I will bring you back. Even at that time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise. Is he repeating himself again? 
He is. Among the peoples of the earth, when I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. How good is that? Listen, the, the biggest blessing is what? For eternity, the biggest blessing is going to be what? Jesus. Period, right? He can stop there. He doesn't, he, he always, he layers it, his blessing. He could just, we could just have him and it would be all we need. And he's like, oh, and I'm going to put some icing on it. You're going to be, uh, you're going to be rewarded. You're going to have, it seems, we know throughout the context of scripture, there's going to be a, um, some part of governance during the millennial reign where we're going to have occupation, okay? uh, even potentially for eternity. So, another part of prophecy to remember when you read prophecy, okay, it can jump back and forth. So, it can, it can get a little, like, slow down as we read this 12 times. Okay, that's okay. You know, it's kind of like a parable. You know, when you read a parable, you're like, I think I got it, but I'm lost again, you know. So, you want to, there, there's an opportunity for seeking here when you read prophecy. So God will, when He's communicating prophecy, He will, He will do like past, present, future, and then He'll jump back and do past, present, future again, and He'll jump to the present. And so you got to look for the correlations to make sure that you are getting it rightly, and we'll never will fully get it right until we get there. Okay, is that fun? All right, so I'm closing. Two minutes. Um, so you got the blessing to Israel. It reminds me of Job's restoration. Where God allowed, right, uh, allowed a taking away, but then double gave back, right? So there's going to be seasons in your life where there's a taking away. And then double reward back later. This is personal. When I was coming back from, when I was leaving Asheville, the day I was leaving, we were leaving the mountain, this, the actual road. And clear, he said, you did it. And I'm going to reward you. I don't even know what that meant fully. You know, I still don't know it fully. Yeah, I know, but I know. I know he said it. And if the reward is this, if the reward, if the reward is him saying that, Cool, man. That's enough for me. Isn't it enough for you? Just him saying, well done. You did it. Good job. You tarried. You trusted. You obeyed. You fell short in ways. I picked you up. I covered that too. Well done. Dude, nothing better. Nothing better. You know how hard it gets. All right. I'm closing. Oh, I got to go now. Um, we will reap as we walk in faith, sacrificing now, sowing seed, planting here, reaping there. And um, I'm going to do, I'm closing with this. I'm going to read it in New Living Translation. It'll take one minute, 60 seconds. Got to do it here. Trust me. I know it's a New Living Translation. I know there's stuff in here, okay? But listen to it, the New Living Translation, the, the chapter, real fast, and, and I say amen. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime. No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Its leaders are like roaring lions, hunting for their victims. Its judges are like ravenous wolves at evening time, who by dawn left no trace of their prey. Its prophets are arrogant liars seeking their own gain. Its priests defile the temple by disobeying God's instructions. But the Lord is still there in the city, and He does no wrong. Day by day He hands down justice, and He does not fail. But the wicked know no shame. I have wiped out many nations, devastating their fortress walls and towers. Their streets are now deserted. Their cities lie in silent ruin. There are no survivors, none at all. I thought, surely they will have reverence for me now. Surely they will listen to my warnings. Then I won't need to strike again, destroying their homes. But no, they get up early and continue their evil deeds. 
Therefore, be patient, says the Lord. Soon I will stand and accuse these evil nations. For I have decided to gather the kingdoms of the earth and pour out my fiercest anger and fury on them. All the earth will be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. All the earth will be devoured. Verse 9. Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia will come to present their offerings. On that day you will no longer need to be ashamed for you will no longer be rebels against me. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. Those who are left will be the lowly and humble. For it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will never tell lies or deceive one another. They will eat and sleep in safety. And no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I will gather you who mourn for the appointed festivals. You will be disgraced no more. I will deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles, wherever they've been mocked and shamed. On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. I will give you a good name, a name of distinction among all the nations of the earth. As I restore your fortunes before their very eyes, I, the Lord, have spoken. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for your chosen people, Jerusalem, God. Thank you that you came and redeemed us as well. We can be grafted in, Lord. Thank you for all the future promises, Lord. Some we see dimly, then in fullness when we see you face to face, God. Lord, may we be a men. Lord, who invest and think about and contemplate your kingdom. And may we never forget that you pay the price that we could have. We've done nothing. It's a free gift. And anybody in this room and anybody listening can receive the forgiveness of our sins and eternal promises of Jesus Christ and dwelling with him forever if we simply believe that you are Lord. And specifically, you are our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Hope you can make it Saturday morning.